For the alleged poet and dramatist, John Webster, there exist, similar to John Weaver, virtually no reliable facts that can be regarded as ascertained. No birth death date, no birth death place, no portrait, etc. Nada. All informations we have today were taken from his writings. He could have been anybody it appears on stage from nowhere and disappears into nowhere. John Webster is best known for his tragedies, The White Devil and The Duchess of Malfi, both seen today as masterpieces of the early 17th century English stage. An earlier video. Click link above began, making arguments as to why Webster must have been among the multitude of pseudonyms of the true Shakespeare that is Marlowe. Let's add some further arguments in this video. To support the notion of John Webster as one of the many pseudonyms of the true Shakespeare. Some interconnections between Webster's tragicomedy, the Devil's Law case, and the figure of Webster himself as Marlowe, the true Shakespeare, seem of significance for several reasons. One, the epistle to the judicious reader. Two, the central theme of bastardy of the plot twist. Three, the outstanding dramatic quality of the play. Four, the dealing of subject of the law. Five, the origin, 1,600, of the play. Six. The proximity to lust dominion. In the epistle to the judicious reader, Webster admits, the reader should be free from his vice of ignorance, that is of not knowing the true author of this play, centering on a plot of a child's fate, of illegitimacy, which, ingeniously acquit itself, that is, himself. Allegorically, he will not praise himself. He has not given way to divers of his friends, whose unbegged commendatory verses offer themselves, to do him a favor, in the front of his poem. It concerned his, own action. Deeper meaning. Webster's, allegorically, confesses, that all the unsolicited, commendatory verses to the author, were invented by himself. The Devil's Law case is centering on a plot twist involving child legitimacy and mother's fidelity. Be aware that illegitimate birth is referred to in nearly every one of the plays of True Shakespeare, it's an absolute central autobiographical theme. Rupert Brooke, an English poet, reflected the beauty of Webster's lines, the masterful welding of meaning, the fineness in the play. Doesn't the Devil's Law case, at a time when William from Stratford, still alive, was in his mid fortes, fit better to the real and true Shakespeare, alias Marlowe? in her dissertation, Women and the Law, in the plays of John Webster, 1991. Of Carol, and, Blessing, two remarkable conclusions were immediately apparent. First. The overwhelming evidence of courtroom trials, law cases, lawyers, judges, discussions about the law, and legal jargon. In short. The law in its many dimensions is intrinsic to each play, as an important ideological, historical, political and sociological construct. Second. The other important feature of Webster's drama is the central role that women play. Running parallel to the concern for law is the re-evaluation of, and often anxiety over, women's place in society. 
including their legal status. The two concerns intersect tellingly in Webster's works, forcing the readers as well as the play's characters to put on trial their own preconceptions of women. According to Rupert Brooke, the closest connection is between Webster's play, The Devil's Law Case, and the tragedy, Lust's Dominion, by Christopher Marlowe. The play borrows from a pamphlet, published in 1599, about the death of King Philip, the second of Spain in 1598. Lust's Dominion was identified with the Spanish Moors tragedy, for which Henslow recorded payment to Decker and others, in February 1600. significant borrowings, in Lust's dominion from Marlowe's plays. Tambelaine, The Massacre at Paris, The Jew of Malta, Edward II. As well as from Shakespeare's plays, Hamlet, Richard II, Romeo and Juliet, Caesar, to Henry IV. Have been elaborated. Be aware, these ludicrous inconsistencies will never be resolved, as long as an obscure life of the true Shakespeare can neither be thought, nor imagined by academia. In 1612, the eldest son of King James, Henry, Prince of Wales, died on typhoid fever after a short illness. The nation was struck by grief at the loss of a bright and promising heir of the throne. In memory of this outstanding national event, Webster wrote an elegy, a monumental column, combined with similar elegies of Cyril Turner and Thomas Haywood. Can it really be coincidental that two rather unknown poets, Cyril Turner, John Webster, and Thomas Haywood, wrote not only high-grade poetic elegies about deceased Prince Henry in the same volume, but also with some content relating to themselves? We do know about Cyril Turner, similar to John Weaver and John Webster, virtually nothing, beyond his literary works. Who? Who on earth? Was this absolute phenomenal obscure poet? Over a century, there was an amazing high esteem of the overwhelming literary, dramatic and philosophical substance, of this obscure dramatist and author, Cyril Turner. John Simmons, in his introduction to his book on Webster and Tournur in 1888, concluded about Webster's real greatness, as a dramatic poet. There is no poet morally nobler, than Webster.
why have none of the so-called Shakespeare experts ever even attempted to answer the question of why the Stratford Shakespeare, much alive in 1612, did not contribute a funeral elegy to the national tragedy? Isn't it far more logical and plausible to recognize in the obscure poets as Turner or Webster? And also Haywood, three of the multiple pseudonyms of the only true Shakespeare? Note, there are definitively more pseudonyms of the true Shakespeare. Consider. In our context. Also the funeral elegy for Prince Henry, from George Chapman. There, he reveals in the dedication. His pseudonymous situation, by confessing. That in view of Prince Henry's death, he will not look up to any greatness, but resolving the little rest of his life to obscurity. And allegorically, he discloses his fatal life situation. He knows, God that yet never let him live. Will never let him, die. Webster's tragicomedy, The Malcontent, offers a number of inconsistencies that call for interpretation. The play was published in three successive editions, all in 1604. Quarto 1 and 2 are attributed on the title page to John Marston. Quarto 3 differs considerably, expanded with 11 sizable added passages and an induction by Webster. A plausible and logic explanation of such a constellation, of a rather impossible and bizarre collaboration, is that both Webster and Marston were one and the same author, writing deviously under different pseudonames. Is it purely coincidental that within a year, Webster's play, The Malcontent, and Shakespeare's play, The London Prodigal, appeared with the strange overemphasis of the printed article, The A most reasonable interpretation. The title content of the plays with their authors, Webster and Shakespeare. Should identify the true author by pointing straight and unmissable to none other. Then to himself as the only and real malcontent. Or the only and real London prodigal.
In Webster's Marston's play, The Malcontent, the most important creation is the character of Malavol, who lives in disguise and hurls his bitterly satirical comments and insults out into the world. As in Marston's other plays, there are stunning parodic allusions to passages in Shakespeare's Hamlet. And others. Isn't the title, The Malcontent? A. With its concealed and disguised protagonist, Malavol, and B. With the double falsehood of the two pseudo-authors. Marston, Webster. The perfect blueprint of the true Shakespeare situation. Consider another amazing observation. A. Webster's play, The Male Content, and B. Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew. Both begin not only with a separate, independent prologue, play, but both are also dominated by the figure of William Sly. Can that really have happened? Purely coincidental? Two independent prologues, with the same protagonist, named William Sly. Webster was supposedly engaged in collaboration with many alleged dramatists, particular Decker. Owing to the salience of his genius, Webster's individuality was completely unrealistic, entirely merged in that of his excessive many collaborative fellows. He is, believe it or not, mentioned in collaboration with Decker, Middleton, Haywood, Monday, Drayton, Wyatt, Rowley, Marston and others. A less irrational, more possible, likely and rational explanation, even if difficult to digest, is that not only Webster and Shakespeare were pseudonyms, but also the other collaborative names of a singular existing unexhaustible literary universal genius. All those pseudonymous poets were early dealt, as contemporary poets, at the same, age of Shakespeare, in Algernon Charles Swinburne's book, The Age of Shakespeare. Algernon Charles Swinburne. A highly popular novelist and critic in England during his lifetime. Dealt in this book with Shakespeare's contemporary poets. Not, yet, suspecting, 
they all could have been pen names of the true Shakespeare. Just listen to how Swinburne literarily ranked Webster in comparison to his peer Shakespeare. There were many poets in the age of Shakespeare, who make us think, as we read them, that the characters in their plays could not have spoken more beautifully, more powerfully, more effectively, under the circumstances imagined for the occasion of their utterance. There are only two, who make us feel, that the words, assigned to the creatures of their genius, are the very words, they must have said, the only words, they could have said, the actual words, they assuredly did say. Mere literary power, mere poetic beauty, mere charm of passionate or pathetic fancy, we find in varying degrees dispersed among them all alike. But the crowning gift of imagination, the power to make us realize, that thus and not otherwise it was. That thus and not otherwise it must have been, was given to none of the poets of their time. But only to Shakespeare, and to Webster. What a mighty message, of Swinburne, that there are only two, whose words assigned to the creatures of their genius, to Shakespeare and Webster. Christian Lanchai, an artist and poet from Gothenburg, Sweden, wrote an online essay in 2008, entitled, Webster Read Anew, with four, noteworthy, additional comments, since I fully can agree I will add them. First, Shakespeare never went to Italy, but still had intimate knowledge of special, especially geographical, conditions in Italy. Concerning John Webster, this is even more a thing to wonder at. He could impossibly ever had visited Italy, and still there are instances in the White Devil and the Duchess of Malfi which convey startling local knowledge of Italian places, and characters. Second, he is even more Marlowian than Shakespeare is. His own preface to his plays couldn't be more Marlowian, and you have in his plays very Marlowian traits all over, the theater of cruelty the splendid language booming all over with exploding fantasies of metaphors and parables, the poetry is as brilliant throughout as anything written, under the names of Marlowe and Shakespeare. Third, John Webster could have been an effort of the poet to continue writing tragedies, but under another name, for some reason or another. Fourth, my main point, is the view, that Marlowe, Shakespeare and Webster have too much in common for the idea of the three, being one poet, to be easily refuted. 